What is going on, folks? It is Dr. Remy LeBeau, and I'm coming at you once again from the X Lair to provide you my deep and insightful thoughts into something that was very unexpected and an amazing surprise. Just such a wonderful gift from the universe. A new Kevin Williamson written slasher movie. What? Sick. Where, where did this where did this come from? All of a sudden, it just popped out of nowhere. It's on Peacock. I'm not going to talk about spoilers just yet, so I'll just kind of have general thoughts about the situation before I get into actual spoilers. Um, but it's on Peacock. I think it dropped yesterday. And uh, it's a slasher movie, and it's written by Kevin Williamson. And it's directed by um, by this dude. I, I forget his name, unfortunately. But I'm sure I will know it in the future, because this this guy this person they know what they are doing like amazing work on this movie in the direction um it was very evocative of Wes Craven and Scream it was very evocative of Wes Craven and Scream so what this kind of was it was like it was like Kevin Williamson back into sort of the the slasher genre giving his special blend of slasher violence and experience and uh and but 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 taking out a lot of kind of the the clever uh, repart repartee between the um, the various characters, right? Like the banter, the back and forth. Uh, you have to apologize. I have to apologize by the way. It is uh, what is this? Twelve thirty on a, on a Saturday. It's late, and I have been smoking marijuana. So therefore, uh, legally in California, of course, and responsibly. And, uh, and so I'm a little bit stoned, but I had to get some thoughts down because the reality of the situation is like, this is a new slasher film by Kevin Williamson. So Kevin Williamson did Scream 1. I was impressed. It was Scream 2 that really got me though. I mean, maybe it was the fact that I was a slasher fan for so long. And Scream 2, I think is sort of the pinnacle like slasher movie where like all the the chases and the kill sequences are just so memorable. You know, there's something really special about the experience of Scream 2. Scream 1, yes, amazing. The entire concept, the meta nature of it, the 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 two killers, spoilers for Scream 1. Um, everything great. All, all the actors in it, fantastic. Killing off, you know, the main poster star, the main featured star, right off the bat, fantastic. I mean, it's ground, it was groundbreaking, but I, I think in terms of experience, Scream 2 like really created a special experience for me when I went to see it at the movie theater. Like, it's just like the movie theater sequence, the, the, um, the, the, the killing of Sarah Michelle Gellar, um, the, uh, the, oh, the car chase. And then the car escape. Oh man, that's a that's a fucking sequence. The the um, the Dewey and uh, Gale uh, film school chase. Oh my god! Like oh, and then fucking Sydney uh, on the stage with like the Cassandra staging, like you know, being set off. I mean, amazing. I, that movie is pinnacle slasher for me. I think. Um, having watched, you know, I, 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 my, my own personal relationship with slashers goes back to Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3. I was a very young boy when uh, somebody brought it over. We watched it and it fucked me up. And, um, and then I just, I fell in love with it. I fell in love with it because it is ultimately a very good movie. Um, and then I just kind of followed that like Freddy trajectory and that led me to Friday the 13th, which are awful. I don't think there's any good, any really good ones. I think we fool ourselves into saying there's a couple of good ones, but none of them are really good. Um, and um, so that's just like whatevs. And then Halloween, that was terrifying because it was like, it was, it was like no holds barred killing, a relentless killing machine, but without, you know, the extra sort of mythology of like Freddy and the nightmare stuff and all and then the, the ultimately the jokiness of it all, right? Like Michael Myers remained like just a cutthroat killer. And it was always so terrifying to me because I was a little kid. So I went to see part, Nightmare on Elm Street part four, like 
four or five times in the movie theater as a kid. I would sneak in. Um, anyway, so I have a long history with slasher movies, um, going back to my very early childhood. And my family was not, like, strict on me. Like, I would go to the movie theater by myself, you know, several miles, taking the public bus in the San Fernando Valley here. And, um, you know, I was, I was young. I, I was probably 12, 11. Who knows? I can't remember exactly. Well, I guess I, I could... Let me think. Eh, I'll, I'll figure that out eventually. But, like, I was a little kid going to movie theaters, sneaking into R-rated movies, watching horror movies. I did it with my brother sometimes, my older brother who was two years older. But oftentimes it was just me. And um, so it's like, it, it got into me, you know? And I think it was more about, like, kind of conquering the fear that it gave me. As a child, having nobody to explain it to me, just having to process the the the, the reality of it, and then understanding it for what it was, and then appreciating it. That, that just, it was sort of like me conquering, you know, like a dinosaur or something, like climbing, climbing, you know, the tallest mountain or something, you know, metaphorically for a child, right, in, in my development. Anyway, uh, played a large part of my life. Uh, Scream 2 finally came along. That was pinnacle horror slasher for me. Uh, Scream 3 was a disaster. Uh, I love Scream 4, freaking love it. In fact, I think... I mean, I, I, I'm going to have to say that's my second favorite. I know these are hot takes as far as the Scream franchise goes, but I know people revere the first one as, like, the best, but I really love Part 4. Like, I really, 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 really love Part 4, and I loved it when I watched it because it was redemption for me because, like, I know that Kevin Williamson did not write Part 3. Uh, Wes Craven directed it. He, he directed the shit out of it. It was a, it was a legit Scream movie as a, because of that. But the script, the heart, the soul, it wasn't there. And um, it felt gimmicky at times, and it was just very kind of like, I'm trying to do the thing that somebody that would have done it better uh, is not here to do. And so, and so that movie just, it was such a disappointment for me, because Scream 2, I probably watched it like seven times in the movie theater. I, and like I kept going back because I loved it so much. And, um, and so I was so looking forward to like part three and then that was such a letdown. I remember I, I was up north visiting I, I'm in LA so I was, I was up north in San Francisco visiting a friend who was going to Berkeley and we went to watch it because it was coming out the same weekend Scream 3 everybody was down to go watch it because I was like hey guys I gotta watch this movie um so um and that was such a disappointment and then that really hurt <laughs> that really kind of hurt my soul because like you know I would watch I would you know so, you know when you binge a series like you sit down to watch them and I would watch one and two, and it was one of those series where, like, three ended it, and, like, it always ended on kind of a sour note, because, I mean, it's just, like, such a steep decline from two to three. So four kind of smoothed that out. Four, like, gave it, like, the landing it deserves. Like, I thought it just, it really kind of brought it back to where it needed to be, and and that just felt so good to me, for me, as a fan of these movies, that I now got to have four as sort of the landing spot for the series. And I stopped watching three. In fact, I have not watched three, I don't think, since I got four on home video when it first was released. So that's some Kevin Williamson right there. Um, I know what you did last summer. Like, I, I fucking love that movie. <laughs> it, was, it came out, like I think, right after Scream 2. And I was already in love with Williamson at that point. And so... And so, um, uh, I fell in love with I Know What You Did Last Summer. It's fantastic. And it's ultimately about the experience and, like, the thrills. And, like, and just, the, Kevin Williamson is so good at writing these, like, thrilling chases and and, like, these thrilling stalking moments. Like, he's so good at that. And that's why his slasher genre, like, that, that flavor, that particular flavor that he brings, is is so damn good and sets pretty much the standard. I, I'm going to say it sets the standard in the slasher genre. So, when I heard that this movie Sick was coming out, it's like, oh, shit. Kevin Williamson is doing a new slasher. Oh my God. And guess what? I got exactly what I expected. Like I got exactly what I expected. There was, there was one thing that kind of like was like, all right, that was a swing. I don't know if I'm with you on that. 
But beyond that, holy shit, man, this was fucking awesome. This is like, I imagine like a lot of the sequences, because there were a lot of really big sequences. In fact, a big chunk of this movie is like a chase, like a, like a stalker chase sequence, a big chunk of it. Like meaning that Kevin Williamson understood that that, that aspect of his writing is like the heart and soul. And it is what drives the intensity and popularity of the, of the, of the slasher movies he's drawn. He's, he's written. And so he leaned into that is what I'm thinking. And therefore we got these really extensive chase sequences and like, and it was fucking like Kevin Williamson candy. It was Kevin Williamson fucking candy. It was amazing. Amazing. It was, it was such a great experience. Like I didn't expect it. You know, first of all, the, the first thing I thought, like, right when I realized like, oh shit, this is good. This is as good as I thought it would be. I was like, damn, this movie should have been in movie theaters. Damn. Like imagine right now with Megan out. Now I just saw Megan. I'm not going to, I only do videos like when it's like, when it really gets me. Megan got me. I enjoyed Megan. I thought it was fun. I thought it was well written. I thought it was well done. It did everything it needed to do. But did it like change my life? No. <laughs> did Sick change my life? Maybe. It might have changed my life. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lie about that. I'm that much of a Kevin Williamson fan. In fact, I have something I wanted to show you here. This is a script of the first scream, published I think in like the late nineties. This was given to me by a friend for my birthday in the late 90s. I forget how old I might have been at the time. So maybe around 20, maybe a little bit more. Yeah, around 20, 21, maybe. And his dad owned, owned, I believe, owns still a tuxedo shop, like in West Hollywood, Beverly Hills area. And Kevin Williamson's boyfriend would frequent it. And so my friend would work at his dad's shop. At some point, he interacted with Kevin Williamson's boyfriend, mentioned that I was a huge fan of Scream and Kevin Williamson. And so then my buddy for my birthday got this book signed. Look at this. Gabriel. This is from Kevin Williamson. This is like 1997-ish. Gabriel. Happy birthday. Scream on. Look at this. Read that. Revel in it. Scream on. Kevin Williamson. And another signature in a placeholder, Outer Banks, that's his company. I saw the logo for Outer Banks at the beginning of Sick. So, Gabriel, all the best, Kevin Williamson. I mean, do you have any idea how special this is to me? This is amazing. This is special to me, too, this glove. I. Bought it to commemorate the fact that I finished the first screenplay I ever wrote. No, actually, that was the second screenplay I ever wrote. Um, but I finished it during COVID. It's called Sell Your Soul. This glove, authentic Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, The Dream Warriors, my favorite, my favorite of the slasher genre prior to Scream 2. This is a replica from that movie, from Dream Warriors. Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3, Dream Warriors. It was being sold by Sideshow. I got it to commemorate finishing my first script. Anyway, special to me, special to me. I'm a big Kevin Williamson stan. All right, I'm about to get into spoilers here. So if you haven't seen the movie, turn this off. Go watch it. Enjoy it. Come back. We'll talk. All right. Holy Mother of Jehoshaphat. Okay, I'm going to say the, the thing first that did sort of that was a big swing and maybe I, I'm still sort of processing. It's the motivation, what the motivation for what was happening. And I'm going to say right now, folks, so if you haven't not, if you haven't seen the movie, turn this off. You don't want to know this part. The COVID thing it was just like, okay, I'm down for this to be taking place in COVID, but now you're asking me to accept it as like the driving force of these people that are on this murder spree and they're a family and they've all taken to killing together. It like it's a vengeance killing, but is it because they were very brutal about it and they were willing to kill like innocent people that got in their way. So, you know, were they all psychopaths to begin with, you know, or, you know, it could it. Could it have completely been? The, I mean, they had to be psychopaths to begin with. 
Because it couldn't have completely been that their son was killed by COVID and therefore now they want to go destroy like the people that kind of that 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 let that let the virus to their son who obviously was probably susceptible to it and died. Right? So anyway, like the idea that that COVID would turn them and make them act to that extent that violently. Um, it, it's something that I had to accept. Up until that point, I was super impressed. At that point, I had to process. And then we had the, the sort of the tail end of the movie and that kind of solidified for me. This is fucking dope. This movie is great. It's fine for there to be like a big swing sort of thing in a movie like this. It's Kevin Williamson. I respect it. But he ultimately brought it back you know like he like he threw it out it sort of missed for me anyway like that motivation was a little bit shaky but but then like the game came back to where it needed to be where it was impressive and just you know ultimately landing as like all right this is quality kevin williamson kevin williamson also wrote the faculty love me some faculty love me some faculty um Teaching Mrs. Tingle, I believe originally it was going to be called Killing Mrs. Tingle, but I believe because of Columbine, they changed it to Teaching Mrs. Kin. Anyway, um, uh, I, I li I, I've liked his work. Dawson's Creek, I watched a lot of that. Um, yeah, anyway. Oh, uh, The uh, Cursed, the werewolf movie, I watched that. I need to watch that again. I heard there's a better cut of it somewhere. I got to find that and watch it. Um... Anyway, this movie delivered Kevin Williamson candy. Um, so motivation aside, amazing, amazing, amazing Kevin Williamson experience. We open on an opening kill, right? It starts in the middle of COVID. You're like, shit, COVID. Okay, I remember no toilet paper. Okay, fucking. Uh, yeah, we were like really sensitive about being close to each other. Uh, people were weird about wearing masks or not. And, you know, whatever. People were dying. Yes, awful times. We all went through it. It was shitty. Okay, get it. Do I want to relive this? Is this movie worth me reliving this? It's like, okay, okay, I'll, I'll go with it. Um, because it jumps right into one of the great, you know, like set piece, like killings, right? And it's all about suspense. Like that, like Kevin Williamson writes suspense so well. And it, it's such a, it was such a simple sequence. Oh, and there's like texting involved, right? And it, and it kind of is evocative of Ghostface, which... I mean, clearly that was intentional, but I respect it because it's like he's basically calling attention to his shtick, the thing that made him, the thing that that changed the genre, really, and solidified quality of the, of what that genre could be um, standard, right? And so he totally has every right to do exactly what he did, and I respect it because it, it, it kind of called back to it to the extent where I was like, because up until the point where the lady is revealed, and by the way, that, that reveal in the car, fantastic. Fucking stellar. You know, I've already had a fucking intense, crazy experience up until that point. And then that happens, and I'm like, fuck, that's as good. And then that's when we get hit in the face with the COVID thing, and then, so you're just kind of like reeling from like this really intense quality fucking slasher experience to this thing that you have to kind of process. And that's, I like that. You know, that's what art is supposed to do. It's supposed to kind of take you in, in unexpected directions. And this did. It took me in unexpected directions. And I enjoyed it. I enjoyed the hell out of it. In fact, I'm going to enjoy this quite a bit throughout my life. I know. Because I'm going to rewatch this quite a bit. Because I really thought it was good. Um, anyway. So, um, so that opening sequence. Fantastic. Love it. You know. Like, the, the sort of surprises you expect. It, it. Ultimately, again, like with the texting and like the opening sequence, very evocative of Scream. And like, ultimately, up until the, the point of the reveal, it felt like this could have been Scream 3. This could have been the legit Scream 3, you know? And as far as Scream 5 goes, I like it. I like it. I don't love it. And with 6, I'm excited to find out about it. And I'm hoping that Gale plays a big part of it. And I'm, I'm looking forward to it. And I like that they've done the, they've included the six in the title so that it's clear, but it's also subtle. So nobody's like thrown off, but 
at least for like hardcores, we know this is Scream 6. The last one was Scream 5. Anyway, I liked it, but I didn't 100% love it because it wasn't written by Kevin Williamson. You know, there was a slightly different flavor to it, but it was still good. And I did enjoy it. It's for me, it, I think it goes like two, four, one, five, three. So far, we'll see what happens with six. But uh, anyway, so this could have been like a Scream 3, like these sequences. And they would have been dope, you know, to have like like a 20 minute chase sequence, like towards the beginning of the movie that would be really cool anyway um so then you know then we then we get the setup for like the actual experience right it's like oh uh, okay these folks are trying these two college um gals are wanting to get away and isolate so they go to the rich girl's father's cabin that's very isolated it's enormous and then there's sort of hints that the guy may be there and then they kind of throw tell us oh no He's not there. That's this other dude. It's her ex-boyfriend, blah, blah, blah. There's some drama there. Uh, oh, no, but then we find out, oh, no, but actually the guy is in there. And then um, and then it all sort of starts to spiral, right? Uh, the killing, the chasing. Uh, well, wonderful. Just wonderful. A wonderful experience. Like, so well-directed, evocative of Wes Craven, um, but with, a, like a, like, a daft hand, you know? Where it was just like, okay, you revere this this content, you understand it, and you're willing to give it everything that it deserves to be as great as it could be. And I think this this director pulled it off. I wish I knew. Actually, do I know? Hold on, hold on one second. Oh, damn. All right, I lost my frame there for a second, but I'm getting it back. I'm getting it back. Hold your horses. Uh, sorry about that, folks. Um, all right. So, um, John Hyams, John H Y A M S, John Hams, is the director. Amazing, amazing job, amazing job, John Hyams, John Hyams, amazing job. Like, uh, um, great execution of the content, just really fantastic. Um, really, just making sure that everything's still recording. So really, um, so intent driven, like the way it was staged, what we saw, it was great. I really enjoyed it. I like, there was so, like, it was so, it went on for so long. Like, it wasn't like, oh, we're going to go over here and do this thing over here and someone's going to get killed over here and then we're going to go over here and do this thing and get killed over here. It's like, and also the movie teased you as being like this slasher, but ultimately it reveals like, oh no, it's like this weird revenge tale that is sort of a slasher, but not really. Because first, like when the first dude, when the first dude is taken down, the first killer is taken down and you find out there's a second killer, I was already like, okay, there might be a third killer. And then, you know, a third killer never showed up. But, like, you saw that one of the, one of the, the killer that was, that found the, the dead killer, which was ultimately revealed to be his son, had empathy for the kid. So you knew that there was something going on between them. They weren't these heartless killing machines. Like, there was something else maybe more in-depth going on. Um, anyway, the chase continues. It's fantastic. We have that sequence on the draft, on the raft which I thought was fantastic, uh, with the knife coming up to the raft. It's been a while since we've, we've had a raft scene. Maybe not since The Raft in Creepshow 2, where, by the way, we had a really great like Speedo moment <laughs> that as a young, uh, closeted gay boy um, really uh, was affected by. Um, anyway, um, th th we had another great raft sequence, you know, and then... It just kept going, and then we go into this other house, and then there's this dude there, and he's, like, acting like a dick, and then all of a sudden, he's killed. We've seen this. I've seen this, like, I, there must be, like, a Halloween 2 moment, maybe, in the hospital, where there's a security guard, maybe, and it's a similar to, like, yeah, let me help you, <laughs> and all of a sudden, he's dead. Anyway, but, like, I love, I love it. I love that it happened. It was surprising, and I love that the, the killer was just depicted as just relentless, this killing force. 
And then finally we get to the part where the mom is not letting uh, the girl in. So you're thinking, okay, because I'm the, this is um, Jane Adams is her name. She, I, I'm remembering now. She was in that show Hung with uh, Thomas, uh, Thomas, the guy that played the Punisher in the first Punisher movie, the really hot dude that played the gigolo in Hung. Uh, anyway, oh, he was in the, he was in the Mist. Oh, I love the Mist. Oh God, I love the fucking Mist. Um, anyway, this chick, Jane Adams. Like she drives up, like she, she does the whole shtick of like I can't let you in unless you put on a mask. You're thinking, is this just like a, like like kind of a weird kooky mo moment for like a character? And I was I bought it because Jane Adams is that good, and that's this this is something I have to mention. Like she was my MVP for the movie. Like she really sold, and that's why ultimately I think I accepted the motivation because she sold it. The other guy sold it too, but not as good as her. Like she sold it really fucking well. This is Jane Adams. I, I was I was impressed. I was impressed, and I bought it. It's like okay, I get. I buy that you're fucking crazy because your son died of COVID, and now you want to kill people that led to him having COVID, and other people that maybe might have caught COVID. I don't know. Anyway, she sold it, and I got it. Jane Adams, fantastic. Um, MVP. She shows up. We find out the mask is drugged. Fantastic. Um, anyway, just a series of moments that are great, um, ultimately with the mom and then in the kitchen, we reveal, you know, the, the story. Okay. Now we know the motivation. That's where I'm like processing. Cause up until that point, I'm like, holy fucking shit. This is a, this is like a 30 minute Kevin Williamson chase sequence. Oh yeah. Oh God. I'm like trying to catch my breath, but, um, but then I had to process. Okay. COVID, COVID revenge. Okay, okay, okay. And then bam, we're back into the action. We're back into the chase. We're back into the fights. We're back into the beating the bad people. And, and like, and then you see the father thrown off the, off the, off the balcony stairwell and he like falls on the antlers and he dies. And it's like shocking. I was shocked. I was shocked about that. Um, and then the mom fucking, like she gets pushed out of the, out of the, the door and then they, and then she pops up in the fucking garage, wherever they wound up. Oh, yeah, they're trying to get the tractor or something. Like a snowmobile or something to get the fuck out of there, right? She shows up with an axe fucking selling the, the fucking, I'm a crazy killer fucking thing. And then there's that whole fight. And then there's like gasoline. You know that somebody's going to be lit on fire. And but that, But the way it was executed, like it wasn't cheap. Like it was all very well planned out and executed. So it was clean. So the experience was smooth enough that I was like, yeah, this is fucking dope. Yeah. Fuck yeah. And, um, and so ultimately she gets fucking, she gets lit and she runs out of the barn and then you get this fucking beautiful shot of her like running on fire down the road and then eventually falling down. And it's just, it was such a striking image, you know, I was like, yeah. This is, this is, this is the treatment this script deserved. And it got it. It got it. This, John, John Himes did an amazing job executing something Kevin Williamson wrote. Again, the COVID thing, a little bit questionable. That aside, Kevin Williamson candy. Amazing, amazing gift. I have a new Kevin, Kevin Williamson movie to watch now. I love it. Thank you, Kevin Williamson, for sitting down and writing another slasher movie because fuck yeah. I mean, that's it. And honestly, I know you're just an executive producer on the new Screams, but maybe like just sit down and maybe you should write one. I I'm not saying the other guys aren't doing a great job because they are, but they're not doing your job. And, I don't, and it's not, I'm not saying your job in the, in the sense that it's something you're obligated to do. I'm saying your job in, in the sense that you created this and like, what you can create in that world is unique and it's it's signature to the series and what they did was celebratory of that but it was not exactly that that's all i'm saying i respect what they're doing but if kevin williamson you ever happen to see this i ask that you please just write 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 the next screen movie you know just write it bring back sydney you know you know anyway all that aside, I really enjoyed Sick. I really recommend Sick. I mean, I, I mean, 
if you've come this far, you, you've seen the movie already. So just go recommend it to other people. And, um, and yeah, it's just really great to have a surprise like this. And I therefore had to, you know, turn on the camera and get out, get it all out, you know, because it deserved it. It's fantastic. Um, Kevin Williamson is awesome. This is a great movie and uh, I'm really happy. Anyway, happy new year to everybody. Hope everybody is doing well this year. I hope this year brings great things for everybody. Uh, life is turbulent. We do our best. Do your best on a day-to-day -day basis from a, on a moment to moment basis. Just try your best. That's all, that's all any of us can ever do is our best. And that is more than enough. Anyway, as always, I want to remind you that if you haven't already, you better put an X in the box because ain't nobody checking me. Take care, folks. Bye-bye.